what is the real value of visual storytelling? So that question prompts in my mind a, a story or a memory of one day in Los Angeles. This was August 2005. The TV was blaring in the living room. I was in the hallway, and then I heard a voice on a TV show that was that uh, a news show that was playing at the time. And the voice was a familiar voice. It was somebody that I had just been working with, uh, my client named Mark. And and it, it just was intriguing me. Why would my client that I was just talking to be on this national news program. So it turns out that he was in Angleton, Texas. He was in this courthouse in Texas. He was there because uh, his client, Carol Ernst, on the left, her uh, husband unfortunately died of a heart attack. And she took it upon herself to investigate and find out, well, what, what killed him? He's a young guy. What, what could possibly lead to his death for somebody so healthy? So she did her own research and discovered that he was taking a painkiller. And as she investigated more, found out that the painkiller actually increased the risk of heart attack and that there were studies that the company had that they did not share with the public or with the doctors. So she took it upon herself to bring this company to court and to show the evidence to the jurors and let them decide and find justice. So it really was a David and Goliath story. So Carol was taking on this giant, giant corporation. So in order to do that, she went out and she found Mark Lanier, an attorney uh, based out of Houston, who specializes in, in cases like this. So he's a plaintiff's attorney that, that you know, works with folks like Carol to bring these cases to trial. So, so he says that every big trial he has like this, he likes to take some skill set to the next level. So this time it was PowerPoint. I didn't even know PowerPoint was used in a courtroom at the time. And so he uh, ended up saying, well, you know, I, I, he uses it uh, for Sunday school. He, he has used it in court before, but this time he wanted to, um, to, to take PowerPoint to the next level, the way he used it in the courtroom. So he says, he recounts the story saying that before the trial started, he went out on a, on a trip, bought a whole stack of books about PowerPoint, and would read a book, and, and the you know, first book was telling him how to make the bullet points look prettier and how to change the font colors and so on, but didn't really get to the core of what he was looking for. So my book had just come out, Beyond Bullet Points, uh, just a couple months before that, and that was one of the books that he had. And so we read the book, and the next thing you know, I get a phone call um, from, uh, from Texas, you know, so the voice on the other side says, hey, this is Dara. Uh, my, my boss, Mark Lanier, has read your book, and he'd like you to come out to Texas to help to create the opening statement for his trial. So I didn't even know what an opening statement was. So it turns out, at these big cases like this, the very first day, both lawyers from each side stands up and delivers an overview, a story of the case. Now, interestingly, all of these lawyers have consensus and agree that this story that they tell on the day one is going to have a massive effect the rest of the trial because they believe that once the jurors hear the very first stories, the first day that they decide which way they're going to go with the verdict on day one, and then from that point forward, everything they hear is filtered through that lens. So attorneys like Mark, you know, he, he, you know, this case, he probably spent over a million dollars of his own money bringing this case to trial. So they, they believe that these are very important presentations and high stakes presentations. So, um, so I said, well, sure, you know, but Mark or Dara, I was talking to Dara at the time and, you know, told Dara, I've never been in a courtroom before. I know nothing about the legal background. This was written for a business audience. And she said, none of that matters. Mark just wants to know about the story. Can you help us with the story? So I flew out to Houston and we worked for a day or two on his opening statement. And what was interesting is that, um, you know, arriving there, I just realized the scope of the problem that they were facing. They had over 6 million documents in that case. They had the complexity of describing the science behind the drug, all these studies on the drug, they had hundreds of hours of depositions, they had so much information that they needed to deal with, and they had to somehow take all of that and make it easy to understand for a group of high school educated jurors that were sitting in the jury box. How could you possibly do that? So we went through this method and came up with the opening statement. 
And Mark stood up that first day in trial and he delivered the opening to the jurors. And what was interesting was that the very, you know, it was a really high profile case. And so there were a lot of national press there. And it was interesting because uh, the next day, the press coverage was about the presentations themselves and how dramatically different the two presentations were. Specifically, the, the defense side, they used a conventional PowerPoint approach. It was all about us, our company, pictures of the CEO, this is how wonderful we are. And by contrast, Fortune magazine called what Mark did with that PowerPoint frighteningly powerful. How the images and the words, the whole experience came together to make a huge impact on the jurors. So, you know, we really succeeded that first day to, to, to you know, get across this message. Um, six months later, they interviewed the jurors and they still remembered that opening statement. Six months later. So the trial went on for about uh, five, six weeks. And then it was the next, uh, you know, five weeks later, and that's when I was in that living room in Los Angeles. And the news programs were about the verdict. So that day, he was on television talking about the verdict that was delivered that day, $253 million. A verdict of $253 million. And so the value, the monetary value, you know, according to Mark, you know, Mark told me, he said this presentation had a huge impact on these jurors and was a big contributing factor towards this big verdict. And what was interesting from a presentation perspective, presentation professional's perspective, is I, um, you know, I use a lot of slides cause, because it's more like a film strip to me. You know, we're just presenting smaller chunks and doing it at a faster pace. And so I um, counted up all of the slides from the opening statement and the closing arguments. And believe it or not, there were 253 slides. <laughs> <laughs> So the real monetary value of that presentation was a million dollars a slide. Now I always, whenever I tell this story over the years, I always get two questions. So the first question is, did you get a percentage of the verdict? <laughs> and unfortunately in legal cases you can't do that. It's illegal to do that because it has to do with like, you know, putting a bet on the case and so on, how it's going to turn out. But actually, it's an intuitive question that a lot of folks ask that somehow it makes sense to most people. And we'll talk about this more during the presentation. If the value of that is so big, what percent of that value is it worth to have you guys get that edge to them? You know, help them to win. What, what's the, you know, get that special thing that's going to you know, help make a decision that will win a big verdict or win a big sale or whatever it is that you're trying to help your clients to do or to do yourselves. So the second question I always get is always harder for me. Like, what's your background? How did you end up doing this? How did you become a visual storyteller? And I'm more of a, a introvert, actually, so it's often really hard for me to kind of go into detail and tell my own story. My best friend, whenever we go out and meet new people, they always um, ask what I do, and I say, oh, I do presentations, and he's like, oh, shut up, you know. Uh, let me tell you what he does. Like, he does all this amazing stuff. So it's harder for me to, you know, to really articulate my story or my background. So I did a little bit of work on that and I want to share that with you in just a second. But before we do that, I'd like for us just to, uh, to take a couple minutes. So I'd like to ask you to turn to the person next to you and we'll just take two minutes and ask each other that question. How did you become a visual storyteller? So let's just aim to take like a minute, ask the person next to you, and then a minute, you know, you ask them. But let's just take a couple minutes and answer that question. Does anybody want to share their background or what, what ended up contributing to you being a story of people? Yep. Any volunteers? Oh, there's one right over here. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Sorry, Richard made me do that, by the way. But um, <laughs> um, as I was just saying to Richard, um, I left college, I did business, um, I put my CV around London, and it was the first job I got, was doing reports and 35 millimeter slides for okay. uh, a, a consultancy type firm. Yep. And I've been working in that field ever since. Awesome. So it's luck, serendipity luck. Okay. and luck. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, I can relate. Anybody else? Yep.
John, right here, was just sharing with us that his... <laughs> I like the way That's he right. did that. <laughs> John was sharing with us that his father was a preacher, yep. and when he gave his sermons, he was always telling stories. And he said, I can do that. <laughs> yeah, that is awesome. That's pretty much it. <laughs> no, I, I, I've always, you know, after that, I, I was always into... Uh, putting on a show, writing a play, okay. writing music, and uh, you know, it's just kind of grown from there. Awesome. So the arts and the plays and the show. Awesome. Yeah. That's terrific. Very good. Do one more over here. Hi, I'm Jackie. I'm in academic medicine, and the reason I got into this is I was mad and very frustrated going to conferences. That's what I do, and I present in seeing my colleagues, physicians, PhDs present, and getting angry that they were wasting my time yeah. sitting in the audience, <laughs> and, um, and I didn't want to be like that, so I, like your lawyer friend, yeah. have gotten not all the books, but some of the books, and I'm just self-teaching because I don't want to be like that. Awesome. Thank you. How many people can relate to that? Like the sense of anger, I can, I can relate to that as well. Well, I want to share with you then kind of my, my story here of how I became a visual storyteller. And so I, I wanted to approach this at a meta level, like using a visual storytelling approach to be able to figure out my own visual story of how I became a visual storyteller. So with that, you know, I think with any uh, approach to finding a story, I would look at, you know, a, a couple of elements. What am I looking for? You know, the first thing I'd look for is what's the through line like what's the story what's the you know the what's going to be the overarching element that ties everything together the second thing is then to select what's important you know what's going to back up that story because out of a, a thousand things in a limited amount of time and limited storytelling of you know fr time frame we can only pick five of those three five of those things and the last thing would be you know how to connect those dots how to find meaning in all of that. So I decided to um, take on a little project using uh, an alternate visual storytelling tool, Google Photos. So the, my goal then was to take every visual artifact from my life, every photograph, every slide, every document, everything that I had in boxes, everything that my dad had in 35 millimeter slide carousels, to digitize and scan everything and put it all up on Google Docs. So that's what I did. So I went through, uh, for example, here, these are all 35 millimeter slides I sent off to a company and had them scanned. Then I, put, I uploaded all those into Google Photos. And so you know, each thing like this maybe had you know, 20, 30, 40 photos. And then I selected one image as the album cover uh, of that particular group of photos. So that was one meaningful image that conveyed what that point in my life was about. And then so I did that, you know, starting through childhood, and then just created these little buckets of information that had a chronological order and had some meaningful events. So like we lived in Germany, so this is like just a couple of uh, buckets of inf visual information about that. So I did that from childhood, from my birth, actually my parents' story, my birth, my growing up, my entire life, I took and put into Google Photos. So right now on this phone, I can now access every image through my entire life from birth and forward. So, so uh, it's interesting that when I did that, it struck me that people say, you know, people who've had near-death experiences say that they see their life flash in front of them. <laughs> so it kind of struck me that somehow there, you know, this was becoming a meaningful enterprise to somehow chronologically gather this in some sort of meaningful way. But things got really cool when I would go into uh, Google Photos and I found out this uh, a particular way you can look at all of the images at one time. So this is from Google Images. They actually changed the aspect ratio of the photos. Right Now they're square, but back when I did this, they were much more interesting to look at. But this is my entire life in one image. So then that was my starting point. Once I had done this, and of course it did take a while <laughs> to go through and do all of this, but as I was going through it, I was kind of looking for a story thread, looking for something meaningful. And so what I came up with is my story thread going through here. It started, of course, with my parents. So this was a 
35 millimeter slide that was first you know, of my parents' wedding. So we've got Ruben from South Texas over here on the left, and he was a military guy, Air Force guy. And he was stationed in Germany where he met Hildegund. And an interesting thing that I found out in terms of my visual storytelling is that uh, when I was, um, my mom was pregnant with me, so she, this was right here in San Antonio at Lackland Air Force Base, just like a couple, you know, really close to where we are right now. But my mother did not speak very much English at all. And so she learned English by watching television. And she tells the story that when she was pregnant with me, she was watching this soap opera. And on the soap opera, there was a very handsome character <laughs> named Cliff. <laughs> and so when she was figuring out what to name me, she named me Cliff. So I was born from a visual storytelling medium from the very start. But one of the things that struck me, though, as I was looking at, you know, the, my origin stories, you know, is that, that we all have, you know, every story that we know now has certain structures and patterns and that we all face some challenge, right? So a story, a hero's journey is all about beginning an adventure and facing some challenge. So I was thinking back, like, what are the challenges that I was facing, you know, from the very start. So I know that on my dad's side, he was from South Texas and, you know, went through a lot of difficulties in the family having to do with, um, you know, he was uh, uh, right on the border with, with Texas and there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of untold stories even now of a lot of harassment and the family went through a lot of, a lot of traumas at that time. And my mom uh, in Germany was born in 1940 at the start of World War II and actually was bombed into like a house uh, twice, you know, as an infant and then as a three-year-old, they were actually bombed into the basement. And then for both of them, you know, right before I was born, my... Um, they gave birth to a daughter who they tragically lost before I was born. So I was born into, you know, a lot of stuff that was happening, um, as we all are, you know. And so if I were to kind of look at what were these things that I was facing, even as a little kid, you know, some issues like it was very chaotic growing up, you know, there's a lot of complexity. And it was very confusing. Can anybody relate to these? <laughs> Any families growing up, we had to deal with this sort of stuff. And so I would say that that was my point A. That's what I was facing. And so if that's my point A, what was I looking for? You know, I was looking for some sense of clarity, some understanding of what all this was about. Some, for me, some sense of creativity to be able to express what was going on and make, making sense of things and connection. You know, something that was often lost in all that craziness that was growing up. So then as I, I looked then at that being my storyline, you know, I, I went through, as I went through all those visual documents to look what it was that happened early on that was really influential or what indicated, you know, the, the, how I was able to, to proceed with my own story. So I looked at there were just a couple things from when I was a kid that really carried through as an adult. And this was... Um, I remember in English class, we had a, a poetry assignment, you know, haikus are five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. So I uh, wrote a poem that's a syncane, which is two syllables, four, six, eight, and then two. So I wrote one in English class and then submitted it to this poetry contest, and it was included in this anthology called The January Morning. Crispy, crunchy, and light, bright sun rays flickering through the darkness of the forest, shining. So with that, as I looked at that, it's like, that's really familiar, the sense of poetry, of distilling something down to its essence, to be able to use very short, concise, brief words. But that's actually something that you'll see in a second, even through the visual storytelling that still has stayed on a through line. This was interesting. This is my very first uh, presentation uh, called The People Called Him Wizard about Merlin. <laughs> I think this is probably seventh grade. And I remember using these note cards uh, is anybody given a speech using note cards? <laughs> and then um, after that, I was uh, uh, the, the yearbook editor, and I remember just loving this juxtaposition of text and image. No software at the time, so I actually used tape to like tape out this stuff and to create the star. <laughs> there was no this, this was all done by hand back then. But I remember just this interest in this images and words and how those might work together. And then this last defining thing from like when I was a kid was this, uh, this contest. It was a journalism contest. You had 30 minutes to write a headline for it's a journalism competition. 
30 minutes. They give you six stories, and you've got to write six headlines within very confined constraints. Does anybody remember like having to count headlines to be able? So you had to you had to count headlines <laughs> to to make sure that they fit within certain sizes the way newspapers worked at the time. That's right. W's counted as two. So this story was about a, a biology lab that smelled like formaldehyde, and then they made the, the phot photography class go take pictures in there. So my headline was, what's that smell? Photo session in bio lab raises big stink with kids. <laughs> <laughs> the second one was about a, a dress in Texas. A Marion went through this uh, sewing competition that said, oh, day is so good, she's going to stick. So this was the actual, so I actually had these, the, these uh, um, headlines. Uh, and what happened is I won like the regional contest, the local contest, regional, and then the entire state of Texas, I was the best headline writer. But I remember that just being the, 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 the way the word, you know, having some sense of fun with the words to make it really interesting. That, that remained a theme. So after that, I went to college and then joined the Air Force where I was a public affairs officer for six years. So second lieutenant, Cliff Atkinson, at a state-of-the-art computer, <laughs> writing up an, a, a, an article for the base newspaper. But with that, at that time, you know, I was also in charge of the newspaper, also in charge of uh, community relations and also media relations. But one of the things that I remember was doing the base presentation which was done with this thing called a 35 millimeter projector. Some of, some of you guys may not know. And uh, the way this worked though is that there were multiple slide projectors that were all in big racks and they were all synchronized to music. And so these uh, images, so it you know, made them look like they were moving just with these images that were mechanically synced, a uh, kind of predecessor to what we do with PowerPoint today really interestingly. And then I remember going to this uh, squadron officer school and giving a presentation using this state-of-the-art technology called the overhead projector. And I found the actual slide, the, the acetates that I did to give this briefing <laughs> to my fellow captains at the time. But with that, you know, I just am sketching out a fun uh, graphic. The moose is loose. And then this image, so this was describing what we did in the military, but just kind of just having fun with this sort of stuff. And, you know, this is out of the context for serious military sort of things. I was just like having a good time with this. But I did, I did do bullet points at the time, says evidence right here. So um, I was stationed overseas, and then I remember traveling a lot and going to places like Shark Cathedral and just being impacted by walking into this cathedral and having the guide saying, you know, that that when these were built, most people were illiterate and they would walk into this cathedral, the images would be projected onto the walls and somebody would come by and tell the stories from these glimmering jeweled images coming from, from the walls. And I was really impacted by that, how this immersive media uh, could, could be used to tell stories as well. So I became really interested in that and then this idea, this was a little sketch for for doing some sort of projected images in some sort of dome or something. And I ended up working with this uh, community in England who recreated the Anglican Mass using projected images. This was in the early 90s that they were doing this. But this was what that room looked like with the projected images and the music and they had a DJ and so on. So after all that, I decided to go to business school. And um, that's where I encountered, for the very first time, this tool called PowerPoint. And I actually found my very first PowerPoint presentation that I did, if you're ready. <laughs> Voila. <laughs> if anybody remembers this, I really went to town. I was noticing I really went to town with those bullet points. So I did the, this one has the gray, the green ones, the green, and then the, the pink boxes. And then over here, I've got the green one. Oh, and then we've got red box bullet points over here. So. I really went to town with that, but that was, but, but at the same time, it was, you know, I was just introduced, and I didn't, you know, I was just using the template to build these and so on. Um, 
After that, though, I went back to San Francisco and worked for a, a startup there having to do with investments and was a web marketing project manager, but again, dealing with images and texts and all the, how that works. But in my spare time, I was still very interested in PowerPoint, but more as a creative medium. How could I express myself? you know, using this tool. And I really saw it from the very beginning, you know, looking at PowerPoint from this slide sort of view, which I would call storyboard view, always working from the start, you know, from that big picture view. And so um, I remember just going in there and just putting in a, a, a single image like this one, uh, re referencing back to this is the rose window from Shark Cathedral. But then I would take that, and then I was really interested in, um, in all these images from the the universe, the Hubble telescope at the time. And so I took this images and then I, then I took this image from the Hubble telescope and thought this juxtaposition was really interesting. You know, perhaps this is a story about this eternal quest for meaning. And on the left side, this is our medieval or ancient way. And then this is our current way. You know, something about these images, they're both a circle, but the two of them together to me became almost like a visual poetry. You know, this juxtaposition of images became really interesting to me. So then I decided to, to create a music video that was relating my experience of working with all these dot coms. So I created this thing called dot economy, and this is what that PowerPoint looked like. Where each of the images, this is all animated GIFs. You know, I wanted to create a video, I didn't know video editing software, so I figured out a way to make PowerPoint look and work like a video. When you watch this, it looked like an animated video. So I did that, and then that caught the attention of uh, this guy at this company called the Idea Factory, which at the time was working with startups to do really interesting, immersive training experiences using a lot of projected images. Unfortunately, uh, this was when the dot bust happened, so they lost all their money and closed down, but I was still exploring how to do this myself. So I talked to a friend at Charles Schwab and put on this workshop for them um, called the Art, Science, and Future of Email, but using three projectors and then doing this immersive media experience for them. Um, but I wasn't making any money, so I ended up going back to work for another startup called ZBox. And now you can kind of see the evolution. I built this in PowerPoint. This was their business plan but I built it completely in PowerPoint, so it could be both a presentation and it also could be a printed document, but it was very simple, very visual, uh, built in PowerPoint. And then, this was 2001, I created this visual business plan that took their 300-page business plan and distilled it all down to a single visual. So you can see there's like a through line of how is it that I can tell these stories visually, how can I can dist uh, distill and condense and be able to put everything just on a single image. Still wasn't, uh, that, that company went bust as well. <laughs> so, so I moved to LA and then started to do freelance PowerPoint work for $15 an hour through a company called Artisan. So I worked at a lot, bunch of fun companies but was just traveling around not really making that much money. And then, um, but I was still really passionate about this tool. And I began uh, writing these free articles for a website called Marketing Profs, and just said, you know, hey, I've got this thing to say. I want to, like, you know, I want to uh, put this information out there that we can start to use this as a visual storytelling tool. Still, no clients. You know, I was just doing this part-time work, and then one day I get a phone call, and uh, I pick up the phone, and they say, "Is this Cliff?" I said, "Yes." The guy says, "Hey, my name's David." You might have heard of my company. It's called General Electric. I work for the board of directors. And we just, uh, across the company, came up with this new branding to keep everything clear and simple. And it's worked everywhere wonderfully in the company, except in the boardroom in our PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> Can you help us to figure out how to tell stories better? So that became my very first client, was the board of directors of GE. And this is only because I was just following my passion to, you know, to explore what can you do with this tool. And so I ended up working with them on, this, um, on, on their uh, rollout of their template and then creating some storytelling guides to help them. This was way back in 2003. And then I remember talking about this and then it connected with Rick. And Rick invited me to talk at the very first PowerPoint Live, previously known, now known as Presentation Summit. And then when I was there, then, um, then I met Rick Brettschneider in the back and 
uh, and Rick introduced me to Microsoft, who was looking for somebody to write a book about how to use PowerPoint in a different way. And that's how I ended up in that courtroom with Mark Lanier that day. And that's actually a, a photograph I found from my, I think it was a Nokia or something. I, this was actually from my phone at the time in 2005. So that, that's what took me you know, into to where we started out with the story today. And as I, as I look at the theme, you know, I, you know, I think that, that poetry and what that means to me is the distillation of something really complex, finding the few words that are going to tell a lot of information, that that's been a, a through line there. Puns, having a sense of humor, having fun, trying new and different things. And thirdly, projection, the, the use of these big projected screens in order to communicate our message. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's, you know, as we all explore what we do as visual storytellers, it's worth a thought. Like, what's my own through line? Through line? Like, what is it that I'm passionate about? How is it that this is flowing through the work that I'm doing as well? But I, but I think with those elements, you know, we can see those in this opening statement. So let me, I do want to show you these slides from that Biox case, just to give you a sense for how this all played out in that courtroom. So um, the screen in the courtroom was just as big as this one. Uh, the jurors were sitting right here. Mark had his laptop below the line of sight of the jurors. The article says that he presented the opening without any notes. They didn't know that his laptop was down here. It was his confidence monitor with his uh, presenter view. And then he opened by introducing the jurors to Carol, who was sitting there in the courtroom, and told the story about how Carol and Bob were both single late in their lives. Carol's daughter introduced her to Bob on a blind date, and they hit it off. And pretty soon they fell in love and got married. And they were living together happily for 11 months until something happened that changed everything forever. Bob died of a heart attack, leaving a hole in Carol's heart. So importantly, what's happening here is a, visual, a verbal and a visual rhetorical strategy where Mark knows he's not going to get a big verdict from a, a, you know, a, a conservative jury in, in you know, South Texas uh, for a product liability case. So now he's reframing this, you know, this idea of reframing from a product liability case to what kind of case? Murder mystery, chalk outline. You and the jury get to be like CSI detectives. You get to sort through the evidence and figure out what killed Bob. So now we're really engaging the audience. And this is a key point, like, you know, in, in, a, in a courtroom, there's no interaction allowed with the audience. So you've really got to figure out some really interesting ways to be able to make the jurors feel engaged. So this was a way. You get to be like CSI detectives. We're going to show you a mountain of evidence that points to a pharmaceutical company that put out a drug that they knew increased the risk of heart attacks, but they hid it from the doctors. They hid it from Bob. Nobody knew about it. He took the drug and he died of the heart attack. And we're going to get into all the detail of that later because you're going to hear another side of the story and it's going to be up to you to find justice for Mrs. Ernst. And you can find justice by following the three parts of this case. It's a case about a company that had motive, a company that had means, and how the motive and means come together to kill Bob Ernst. So this one slide now has distilled six million documents, the complexity of the case, to just, just those few images. And the story so far, no legal ease. We framed it in a particularly persuasive way. We made the jurors feel engaged, nothing complex, uh, a theme that they can relate to, CSI. You know, so a lot has happened, as simple as that was, a lot is happening on the back end. So then these became the big three anchor points of the case. So then, you know, the, the three parts of the case uh, going forward, those were the, you know, those kind of stood out when he got to those points. And then the slide convention looked something like this, where there was a simple headline at the top, the image comes up, and then Mark talked to that for 30 seconds, and then he clicked, and then it went on to the next slide. So something was always happening uh, on the screen. So um, really interesting, though, because I think you can, you know, courts are really as conservative as you think they are. And I think it really was a radical new thing for a stack of dollar bills to be on a slide <laughs> in a courtroom. We don't think that that actually has happened before. So it was partly my 
my coming in and not knowing any different. It's just like, let's go have fun and do something really interesting. And then Mark, on his side, was willing to really push the boundaries and ended up, you know, be, you know knew the judge well enough that he was going to allow this. Because some judges won't allow that. So he was able to push the envelope and be able to get this into the trial. But it was a really you know, radical thing for this to happen. And this has really changed and changing how legal presentations are, are done now in that particular industry. So since then, I've been working on tons of cases. He told all of his friends about this and I've worked on, on tons and tons of different cases. Um, but they all have something in common, what we looked at with that very first case, an overwhelming amount of information, uh, a lot of complexity that we need to communicate to the jurors. And so the way that we do this, you know, is kind of spelled out in, in the book that many of you already have, the Beyond Bullet Points book. But at the engine behind this is a process was where we're working from the top down to distill this case. So I always walk in, no matter what complexity the case is, what are the three most important things that you want the jurors to remember when they walk out of this opening? So we start from the top down and then start, okay, now what's going to back up each of those three points? So it's just this uh, logic tree structure that is front-loading the information. So before we get into the detail, we're going to anchor these top-level points for the jurors. And the spell out how to do the, there's a free word document that you can use to do this outlining. But this is what I do every day when I work with the attorneys. Put this document up the morning we spend together uh, working out what the words are going to be, the distilled simple poetry that's going to underlie the outline of the story. And then in the afternoon, then those become the headlines of the slides. And then we add the graphics. So this whole thing happens in one day. So I've got this process distilled into one day. No matter what kind of case, how complex it is, I can pop in, work in the morning from nine, nine to five. By that five o'clock, we'll have a PowerPoint that's 90% done that might just need some follow-up work with, with graphics and specific things we need. So it's possible to make this process happen pretty quickly. So here's an example of a, of a case. This was... Um, just this was from the news media, which is why it's a little bit grainy. What's it about a, a, an explosion at a, at a um, gas plant outside of Texas? And so this was the big anchor slide in this particular case. The company, we'll call them Acme, creates a bomb waiting to explode. So with this image discussing propane gas, how, you know, what, how that works, how what happened is similar to propane that we might have in tanks. Then the very simple images describing how uh, the accident happened. You know, so this is the basic system that's set up, how it works. And then you know, this is a very, very simple, but distilled. You know, so this is taking really complicated diagrams and so on and just stripping away everything that's not relevant and making it really simple. And so we'll, and then in these legal cases, then we always have to back up all this stuff with evidence. So it usually ends up being emails and Zooms and blowouts and that sort of thing. So that's what those look like in those cases. So then we're telling this story. You know, it's always about the defendant is the, 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 you know, the bad guy in this story. And we're laying out how they, they knew about this but ignored the danger signs. You know, and this will often be told with photographs. This is what actually blew up in this particular case. And then the third part of the story is usually about damages and, and what the impact was on the people who were killed or injured. So that's a, a typical, what a typical uh, PowerPoint might look like. But from doing all that, you know, I think I always go back you know, to lessons learned with this sort of thing, is that the most efficient way, you know, often I'll be working with attorneys and uh, they'll come to me and say, oh, we just spent $30,000 on this really cool 3D, you know, generated product that describes, you know, how this thing happened. And then I'll say, is that, you know, do you want them to remember the graphic? Or do you want them to, to feel mad about the bad things that that company did? So it's really focusing first on the underlying story. And you know, so, so often they'll say, we've got you know, 100 different images. We need to put all this stuff in. And say, like, let's focus first on the story. And once you've got the simple story, that actually you know, limits and cuts down and it helps you choose the fewer pictures that are going to be the right picture. So this would be a big takeaway. You know, to find the right picture, let's focus first on the underlying story, the, 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 the specific few things that we want to say, rather than diving in and working on the graphics first. So uh, that, that this tool can actually be, be a big help to get the words uh, structured and in order. 
But you know, through, through after working with Mark, I've also worked on some other really interesting cases and learned another uh, few, few things about like working with a lot of high profile clients. So this is Dick Wolf, who created this TV show, who was suing NBC uh, over some royalties. So he read about this work I'd done with Mark, and he's asking me to help him with his opening. <laughs> when he's like the best storyteller in, in our culture. <laughs> Every one of these TV shows, what in the world do I have to, to teach you? But then I went in and looked at all the complexity, and I said, what are the three things that you want the jurors to remember? And that's one thing that these, these sort of stories don't do, is really help you to distill down and be persuasive. These are entertaining, but not necessarily educational or persuasive. Uh, another case worked on was, this is Brian Panish, like one of the top lawyers in the country, who was working for the Michael Jackson family to sue the entertainment company for hiring the doctor that contributed to, to Michael Jackson's death. So again, it's like, what do I have to, <laughs> to teach or work with this guy that's won every single one of his cases before? But with that, you know, going back to that method really helped. Having this method has really helped to provide a structure. Because often with working with attorneys, you know, they, they just have so many ideas and, and they're going in so many directions. Or it, the process guides them back and brings them back. What are the three things? What are the three things? They'll tell me a hundred things. Well, what are the three things? So it really guides it back. I worked uh, on one of these big cases when Enron afterwards, you know, when they're trying to sort out the the money you know, for this case and, and ended up, you know, well, how it was so complex that um, you know, it came out through conversation, this idea of a house of cards. And so we ended up building these little cards that helped to tell the story about Enron. Uh, ended up at the, in The Hague in the Netherlands at the International Criminal Tribunal for the United Nations. And with that, again, going back to the structure this is going to be a, a limited opening statement helped to distill the story down. And I even worked recently on somebody who was going to argue uh, a case before the Supreme Court. So even though it wasn't a visual story, I'd worked with him on other cases and he was just wanting some help in how do we distill and make this story really simple. So with all of that, you know, I know that I was intimidated working with many of these folks or, or the venues that they're going to present in. But, but one of the big takeaways you know, and I go back to that when I worked for Artisan, you know, at $15 an hour, I was really a commodity. Uh, you know, when we're presentation designers, we can put ourselves in a particular mode where we're, you know, being priced according to other folks as a commodity. But one of the things that shifted was really working as a peer uh, with each of these folks. So as you work with a client as a peer, adding the unique value that can help them to succeed then it just completely changes, especially your pricing, you know, because then you can start to ask questions uh, about how it is that you can, you can price things differently other than uh, an hourly rate. You can do it on a value basis. So I'll show you an example of that would be this company called uh, MV Transportation I worked with. So they had a um, potential pitch to win $25 million in business. So the way a conversation might work with that is, you know, if you can, so this is worth $25 million, right? If you're able to get that edge that'll help you to win this over the competition that are probably using conventional PowerPoint, what percent of that is that worth? What percent is it worth? So that's a much more interesting conversation <laughs> versus 25, 50, 100, 200, 500 dollars an hour. It's more, more interesting to start with the value. And that comes with that peer relationship, if you can sit down with them and ask them, what is the value of this if you're able to get that edge to actually win huge value like that? So I worked with this company and then ended up creating, so they were pitching to deliver, they, they do um, transportation for disability folks and they, uh, you know, that don't have, um, so they, they, they give rides and vans, like paratransit vans for folks who are disabled to go and pick them up. So they were working with uh, Marta in Atlanta and, um, and so this was just the opening slide. You know, I worked with them again. So before the presentation was all about us, you know, you've seen a hundred of these, these are our capabilities, but the dramatic transformation was just a photograph and they told a story and they said, do you remember folks at Marta? Do you remember uh, last year during the snowstorm, every public transportation mode was shut down, but we at MV Transit were the only ones that delivered 
customers and delivered them on time. You know, look at the level of commitment we have to getting this work done. And then the next slide was simply the other company's logo. And then they said, we understand that you've had a lot of other uh, folks come to talk to you about this contract. And we're wondering, what questions do you have for us? Or what challenges do you face? Or where do we stand? You know, so this is just a, a, a prompt to open up dialogue. And instead of just launching in and talking about what we do, it's more asking for information that can help you tailor the presentation to, to you know, what they'd like to talk about. So that was just an example of how that worked. So, so takeaway, you know, last takeaway, practical takeaway, is that you're the one in charge of quantifying the, the value of the visual story, uh, particularly financially. You know, so don't wait for the client to come to you and figure all this stuff out. The degree to which you want to price more, if you want to get more value, financial value, then you're the one that's got to take charge of that and jump in and do that. So that's always something to, to consider, is what's the real value of the story that you're working on. So um, as we wrap up, I, I, you know, we talked about Mark Lanier earlier, and that was only um, one example of a big verdict he had. Um, last year, he was involved in this case. Has anybody heard about these cases? Johnson's baby powder, if you haven't heard about it. Uh, the basic idea behind this is that... Um, so Johnson Johnson's been selling this product for a very long time, but that when they mine talc, there's asbestos in it, and that they actually knew, have known about this for a long time and haven't been telling people that this, that we thought was safe, actually has asbestos in it. So 22 women filed a lawsuit saying they got ovarian cancer from applying this, uh, this, the talc powder. Six of the women, it was actually their family, six had died already. And so... Mark um, delivered his opening statement. And so these are some screen captures of him delivering the opening statement. On the left is a video of him talking, and then you might notice something familiar. <laughs> this was last year. Yeah. That looks kind of familiar. <laughs> Even that one. So I didn't, wasn't watching television this time, but I, I just flipped on my, my news on my phone and saw the verdict for this case last year. $4.7 billion. $4.7 billion. Huge, huge, huge value. So there's no doubt, you know, as we've looked at today, about the financial value of visual storytelling. The sky is obviously the limit with that. But I think we have an even more question, interesting question for us, you know, because as we might look at our own lives, and even at the, you know, look back at our whole lives, we're not going to say, I wish I had more money in the bank account, right? We're not going to look back and say that. We're going to, I'm convinced that what we're going to say is that, you know, we're going to be looking at our, the experiences in our lives. Like, what clarity did I find? What meaning did I find in my life? Uh, what creativity was I able to express? What fun did I have with that? And what connection? How did I connect with the folks I worked with, with other professionals, with my family and friends? That that's really what we're going to be able to take with, with us in the end. But this is all, a, you know, this has been my exploration as I shared with you earlier, what I've been uh, exploring. But, you know, finding this real value of visual storytelling is really a personal issue. And it, it's a lifelong issue, I think, to explore all of this for ourselves. So, so with that, I really want to wish you a lot of uh, luck and a lot of love as you explore for yourself the real value of visual storytelling in your own life. So thank you for having me. <laughs>you hadn't yet written beyond bullet points when we asked you to speak in That's 2003. Right. Why right. the hell did I hire you? <laughs> Have you, had you ever considered getting your own law degree? <laughs> no, look, seriously. That's a really good question. Um, I had, but I thought about it, but, but no, I never really pursued that. But that would be a good idea. <laughs> we have just a couple minutes. Cliff will be joining us in the tracks at 11 o'clock. Questions right now, just a couple of them for Cliff. Yes, sir. Actually, I was really fascinated by the amount of courtroom evidence that you're being produced. And you 
mentioned that uh, it was up to the judge to kind of decide what you could present. How could you loop the judge in along with the attorney that you're working with to validate? Hey, the judge isn't going to have a problem with this kind of tongue and cheek treatment in the action. How'd you work with the judges? So, so that, that's a, a great question because it it's, it's judge specific. So the judges have wide latitude to make decisions. Some judges don't allow PowerPoint at all. And other ones are very pro PowerPoint to start out with. So that's not even talking about the images, but even using the medium at all. Uh, once you actually work with a judge, so normally the lawyers you know, know a lot about the judges they're going to work with and what they can do and cannot do. Uh, but often what will happen is that uh, each side will exchange uh, PowerPoints with the other side. So giving them advance notice so they can look at what, what's in the PowerPoint, the judge might see those. But actually in this one, Mark agreed with the other side to not share it with the other side. So they were totally <laughs> surprised <laughs> by what they saw. <laughs> wow. so. Any other questions for Cliff? One right here. How do you then work with words to go with it? Given the, the interplay of the visual story and the words that really worked, how do you get the words right? How do you find the right words to integrate with your visuals? So, so that all comes in that upfront part. So I mentioned like, you know, do the half day in the morning, just focusing on the words. And I think that, that through that, um, you know, I, I know that me personally, I'm able to really kind of cut through the clutter and they might say blah 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 blah, and, I'll, and then I'll, I'll say, you know, they might say that, and I'll say blah, and I go, oh my god, that's uh -huh. so great that you're able to distill that down. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, um, I mean, part of that's art, right, and just talent, being able to distill something down. But I do teach that sometimes to lawyers and look at poetry, actually have them, you know, create some, po you know, and work at distilling down those images. So, so to me, it's really about that, it's the distillation, and then it's also a cleverness, you know, being able to to come up with some pithy or interesting way to, to present it. And, and there was that statement about 10 minutes before the end, the most efficient, what was that statement? The most efficient way to choose, what was that the right statement? The right images is to find the right words. The right images is to find the right words, very good. Okay, thanks again to Cliff Atkinson.